I'm Brooke Cochran. I'm the president of the Creative Writing Club. Um, we have Jose B. Gonzalez with us tonight. He's going to read some of his poems. Um, so just a little bit of background. Um, Jose was born in San Salvador, El Salvador, and immigrated to New London at the age of eight. Um, he's the author of a poetry collection, Toys Made of Rock, uh, which came out in 2015. Uh, it's based on his journey from a non-English speaker to a professor of English. Uh, he's the co-editor of Latino Boom, an anthology of U.S. Latino literature. Nationally known speaker, Gonzalez has presented at various, at various colleges such as University of Florida, Harvard University, and Cornell University in countries including Mexico, Spain, and El Salvador. His institution and institutions including the National Smithsonian Museum of African Art and the National Smithsonian Museum of, American, of the American Indian. He has been a contributor to National Public Radio and has published poetry in journals such as Corcus Review, Colado, T The Teacher's Voice, Palambra, Accentos Review, um, Colaire, and anthologies including Theater Under My Skin, Contemporary Salvadorian Poetry. He has been featured on Univision and nationally syndicated show American Latino TV. Uh, Gonzalez is a Fulbright scholar and has the and has been the recipient of the New England Association Teachers of English Poet of the Year Award, the American Association Hispanics of Higher Education Outstanding Faculty of the Year Award, Connecticut Name Multicultural Faculty of the Year Award, and the Latino de Oro for Arts of, and Culture. He earned a PhD in English from the University of Rhode Island and an MAT in English from Brown University. He teaches Latino literature, creative writing, Latin American literature, and composition and speech courses at the US Coast Guard Academy in New London. A member of um, Macondo Writers Workshop, he is the founder and editor of latinostories.com. So without further ado, Jose. Thank you. What a wonderful job with that introduction. I always love to see students come on up and, and face those public speaking challenges. You're braver than I was at, at your age because there's no way I would have gotten up here. Did a beautiful job, especially especially being sick and all, right? So so thank you for that. And thank you for your support, you know, your group, um, creative writing group. It's it's great to hear that you are exercising that creative muscle. We are part of a society that disregards creativity without fully understanding that every single day so many of us are touched by creativity. It was Steve Jobs, after all, who said that the iPhone is the perfect marriage between what? The humanities and technology, right? Creativity, so, so important. I want to thank, of course, Dr. Dan, right? Uh, another uh, uh, talented writer. Uh, and, and of course, talk about talented writers. So much talent in this room, in this front row, including folks who I, I saw read uh, years back when Curbstone Press was, was part of our DNA here. Um, Eastern Connecticut State University. I have to say to you students that time and time again, time and time again, when I visit you, you don't um, always recognize the brilliance within you. You really don't. And today, what I hope to do as I read my poems is to try to convince you that a lot of times when we go through bumps in the road and a lot of times when we encounter all kinds of walls and barriers, that we have to look within ourselves and to recognize that we need to love ourselves, okay? So um, I want to begin with this poem, In the Breath of Jesus. I know there are creative writing students here, and I'm gonna begin with a, with a poem that I thought was the most challenging poem to include in this collection, okay? Um, in the Breath of Jesus. When he played Jesus, walking the Holy Week parade miles, circling trails made of isote flowers, showered by the prayers of Sonsonate's streets, his feet would be bare. Mothers would catch up and drop their change in front of candles. His crown would tilt to the side, slide on the sweat of his brow, brows. Hours of bowing and hearing the hollers of miracle seekers would cloud spots in his eyes. Skinny children would point to him, then to a northern star, begging saints of losses and causes, as long as they touched the hand that carried crosses and their wishing wells weren't watered with urine, they'd follow him into river walks. 
after his last fall, when the stalks had turned into sticks and the last amen had been uttered, the man they called Jesus, the man I called my father, would pick up a bottle of liquor on the way home, point to scabs on worn paths, slur something about drifting dreams and sip and sin in the name of his absent father, his hungry son, and a holy ghost. So every now and then someone, um, you know, and I can see why, uh, when, you, when you listen to that poem, you think, okay, so your father was named Jesus. No, he really did. He, that's not a metaphor. He played Jesus in these parades, right? And uh, he was worshipped, right? And to a certain extent, as a son, right, as his son, I totally worshipped him. And yet, he struggled with alcoholism. And, um, you know, when I put together this collection, I, I really thought about audience. I did. Because part of me thought, how can I kind of help my father, right? How can I possibly write something like this and then have others read? And, and to a certain extent, I thought, that's, that's not a kind thing to do to his memory. And then I thought, wait a second, but if I'm a writer, right, I'm not just writing for myself, and I'm not just writing for him, I'm writing for others. And I started to think, well, what happens when you have individuals, right, sons and daughters whose fathers, maybe even their mothers, are alcoholics, right? And, um, and then I thought maybe this poem might help someone kind of come to terms with that and to understand that there are times in our lives when we hit low points, but that there are some high points come along, right? That, that um, even though it might seem like even though it's your father struggling with alcoholism, that um, indeed life can still be okay, right? And that we could still love him, her, and then we could still love ourselves. So my father, um, he came to the United States uh, first uh, when I was a child, and um, he, uh, so, so I didn't see him for a few years of my life, right? And so, I, my memory of him uh, in El Salvador is a little, little cloudy, to be honest, right? Uh, I do remember him cooking. There's one thing, for some reason or other, people say you always remember the smells, right? The smell. And I remember he used to cook these, um, these omelets. And as an adult, I, I made these omelets, and I thought, oh, my gosh, my, you know, this is my father. This is, this is like the way he used to cook, and I had burned them. And I realized, all right, this is the way. Anyway, so um, he then came to the U.S. and um, then made enough money for my mother to come here, right? And then after that, then he uh, made sure that my sister and I, who were left behind with my grandmother, uh, could come join him, right? So uh, coming to the United States, I grew up in New London, and um, this is about playing football for the first time. Before I read it, I want to ask you whether you know the word campesino. I know there's one of you, and, and at least one of you, who knows what's campesino. But this is what I mean. You beat yourselves up, because there's plenty of you who know it, but you're saying publicly, I can't say it. Yeah? Peasant? Yeah, like a peasant, right? Like a peasant, exactly. So um, campesino, right? Uh, this one's called football for the first time. Chipping ice out of a soccer ball, I snap bones with every goal, kick and make hole, melt snowmen goalies who are scorched by every torch that skins their carrot-shaped noses. Sammy T, my neighbor, only one in my class who shares jelly beans at snack time, comes to me with pigskin in his gloved hands, cuts in front of a corner kick, so quick to ask me to quit, cracks, cracks his knuckles and says, why don't you play football? I desert my soccer ball on the fallen needles of a spruce tree. Anything not to be solo me. Leave it for dead and make sides even. Mostly, I block and move aside, except for when Jimmy Fro from Crystal Avenue fumbles the ball and I pick it up and run toward the end zone. It's a victory for me as I look around for someone to high five, but out of the corner of my eye, I see Sammy T, forearm up, aiming for my head, I have no time to step aside, and before I can ask why, my lip bursts and reddens like the color of my favorite jelly beans, the kind that feels so soft on my lips on days that I don't exist, the kind that may harden in the harsh northern cold 
but still are nothing compared to the machetes that slice into campesinos' skulls, right? So here I am. I mean, I'm getting beat up left and right, right? I am. And, and, and um, on our way to school, my sister and I, she's a fourth grader, she's a third, third grader. Uh, I'm, actually, I'm a third grader. She's a fourth grader. I just, anyway, so, so here we are. We're traveling to school. And uh, day by day, we don't know who's going to try to pick a fight with us. Now, when I, when I say we get beat up, I, you know, I mostly got beat up. I'm small. I'm weak. I am. I, we, I wrestled in high school. I can tell you the number of lights that, that, that are in every gym in southeastern Connecticut because I got <laughs> pinned so many times, right? And so, uh, you know, all kinds of people would, would beat me up. And, and, and I tell you, what, every now and then, uh, you know, I, 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 I see... I see the girl who used to beat me up, and I'll tell you, you know, someday I'll get my revenge. Now, I'm, I'm, but seriously, seriously, uh, there were times when we'd come back home, and um, my parents would say, so how was school? And I said, well, we didn't make it. You know, see the bruises, right? Uh, it just didn't make sense for us to go as, uh, after getting, getting um, beat up. And yet, in the context of all that, right, the fact is that getting beat up was very, a very small small, very minor compared to what was going on in, in, in my family's life, right? Um, th that I had relatives who, for example, went, went through part of that civil war in El Salvador who were left behind and who, in some cases, were imprisoned, in other cases, were killed, right? Uh, so, so again, all contextual, right? Um, dirtied gauzes. Brings home boxes of medical gauzes that serve as napkins. So we use them for wiping ketchup from the sides of our lips. Soak them in soap and scrub the sink. Our friends who are used to cockroaches crawling on lemonade glasses and climbing to the tops of popsicle sticks don't think twice about seeing the gauzes at our table. Night after night, the gauzes are lined up at mommy's factory, marked irregular, sentenced to a fire but she saves them and stacks them like wood into her car so we can scour the floor of stains. The evening that little brother is born, she's putting herself to sleep with dulce de leche when she feels her water break into our kitchen floor. Be sure to clean up, she screams as the door is about to close, and she looks toward Yanni and me and a stack of boxes. At the hospital, the doctor performs a cesarean section on mommy who is ready to push and push, but is too small to give birth to such a large child born with a flan belly. Dizzied by English words and Spanish screams, Papi fills out forms and unintentionally gives mommy a maid, mommy's maiden name, Ortiz, to the newborn. He's not the only one to make a mistake that night. Mommy screams for hours as if La Llorona had come and gone with infants in hand while the nurses make hushing sounds as if all that is needed is a lullaby. As the sun cracks through her window, her screams shatter until a cleaning man, short with dusty dark hair, translates the pain for her and insists that there is something wrong with this woman. The doctor finds that wrong. Inside mommy's womb, an abandoned gauze so small that even after he performs emergency surgery and traps it in a jar, mommy's the only one who can tell that the gauze was stitched together in a painfully predictable pattern. And again, you know, creative writing students, right? A lot of times, I think, as writers, we react to prompts by saying, I'm not, I'm not quite sure I, can, I, I can't come up with something original. I, I really can't. And when I write, I try to think of the most original content imaginable. So in this case, I thought, well, if I'm writing poems about my life, you certainly don't want to hear uh, poems about me just, you know, uh, one day, for example, driving on 395 and, and then getting off and, and then... Um, being at the light and then taking off and then recognizing, oh man, did I just hit the police cruiser in front of me? You don't want to hear that kind of poem, right? Even though that might be a unique experience. And the fact is that when I put together this collection, I kept on asking myself, you've got to come, I had, I had about 40 pages and I, and, and I hit a wall and I thought, wow, I need to come up with something more original. And this actually should have been first on the list, right? Because you think about it, how many of you 
How many people have I met whose mothers worked in gauze factories, whose mothers would bring home gauzes to their house, and the families would then, then take them, and, and you, pretty disgusting, actually, when you think about it, especially if it's ketchup, right? Um, and, and then who would have a gauze of all things left inside of them, right? And um, so I think in many ways, the point there is that, you know, when, when we look at our writing, I really believe that sometimes we kind of give up a little too soon and that, you know, if we continue to push ourselves, the fact is that in that case, like that poem, it should have been first on the list when I thought of unique moments in my life, but it absolutely was not, right? Um, so this one, um, so my father, uh, he was a, a um, he worked all kinds of jobs, right? I have, I get, uh, Physically, how can I say this? You know, you, you'll see you'll see me uh, change uh, and, and transform uh, it, my muscles, everything when I hear uh, negative comments about immigrants, right? Because my family and all the people we knew were not only immigrants but hardworking immigrants, right? And and you think about you know in the 30s, uh, in in their 30s and in their 40s, my parents came here and worked and worked and worked. Right, um, and uh, so one of his jobs was as a school janitor in New London High School. Um, when your father is a school janitor, the piss on the toilet seats seeps into the soles of your worn sneakers, stays trapped in your heels, and your feet smack the floor as you walk back and forth between classes. You don't laugh when the class clown trips over himself in the cafeteria, sends his tray flying into the tiles, a pile of half-eaten hot dogs sliding in ketchup amidst broken dishes. You can feel the eyes pointed in your direction as the back slapping makes its way around the room, the brooms come out, the high-fiving gets louder, a mop does a clumsy shuffle. The awful smell of vomit gets inside your throat, but you know better than to release it, so you swallow it as you walk toward the trash bin, standing straight and poised as the clanking of silverware rises, as if rebelling in anger from being thrown with careless force. Forks diving feet first, spoons spinning to the side, knives landing on the puddles of milk and water, the piles of plates spilling to the outer edges of counters, crumbs pounding against walls. After school, when the last basketball has stopped bouncing, you see the dirt and dust from the bottoms of high tops, the sand from snow boots scratching the hardwood. You notice the circle of lovers' crumpled notes around baskets. As you leave the school, you keep your, your, yourself from kicking the soda cans that are leaning against car tires and step over the candy wraps that sail back and forth crazily on the lawn. You go to your job at the supermarket where sales flyers lie on top of grocery carts and plastic bags line the parking lot. At night, after you've set the table and have sat down to eat, the school janitor sits wearing his green khakis and t-shirt at the dinner table across from you, asking you to pass him a napkin. As you hand it to him, you notice that his fingernails are clubbed. You answer his questions about the day, telling him about how one of the guys at school is getting suspended for keeping a hamster in his locker. He laughs. Then he tells you about how he'll need your help once a week at work. He adds that the medicine he brought back from El Salvador isn't helping his breathing, and he asks if you can stop by for an hour or so to help him move a few desks. Maybe sweet. Yes, you say, as you turn away like you did when that doctor showed you his x-ray, told you about the months to a year, and asked again why he didn't wear his mask all those years when he painted ships for a living. Yes, you say, you'll help, because that is all that's left to do when your father is a school janitor. He is, after all, the school janitor. You hear it in the brooms whispering, the school janitor the sweeping back and forth, the school janitor over and over, the school janitor, your father, father, the school janitor, you want to scream for your dreams, the school janitor, your father. So that poem, right, also very difficult. And I don't always read, I've only read that poem a few times, right? Um, 
and and actually I did okay with that with at that time. Usually you're like in the middle of it, you're like you're like someone you know someone screaming, someone get him a tissue or you know get help him out. Um, but again, as writers, right? I'm teaching creative writing and uh, this semester as well. And boy, I tell you, when when we write from the heart, it makes such a difference, right? Um, you're all very smart people, right? But but do you always write from the heart, right? Um, so, so important, I think, in poetry in particular. A lot on immigration. So this one, Sociology 101, Essay on Illegal Immigration. My words corralled inside the margins of a paper that described illegal immigration. Each sentence tried to follow assignment guidelines. Research the professor had said, is to come from public scholars, experts who had studied the impact of illegal immigration on this nation. They had uncles named Sam. I had one named Eduardo who crossed borders but had never conducted studies. What was I to do with him? Without a vida, without a visa, without immigration papers, he had become an expert on how to hire the right coyote, having been hogtied by the migra on his first attempt, he grew eyes on the back of his head and learned that the trick to running is to sprint before a starting pistol makes its first sound. He hurtled over the U.S.-Mexico border on his second try and kept his feet going until he could no longer hear a coyote's howl or an immigration officer's growl. As hard as I tried to keep him from stepping foot on my paper, it was impossible to block him from running through the margins. The day I quoted him, Uncle Eduardo took away the job of a published researcher who was in this country legally. I was sure, as he described a three-week trek from a bus station in El Salvador, crossing the heart of rattling deserts to the mouth of Connecticut, my notes could not catch up with his words. He shifted through memories as, his, as if he was afraid of someone snatching them from him. Stacking my report on top of essays with alien titles, I could see the C that would eventually be placed on my cover page for allowing my uncle to trespass the same way I would the following semester in Introduction to American Literature where I raised my hand and uttered the lonely word, but. And isn't that a lonely word, but, right? You think about that. It's a beautiful word. It really is, right? B-U-T, right? B-U-T, not, you know, not like, you know, my, my, my child, my child one time. No, no, no joke. ESPN has this pool, right, uh, every year, right? You can win tons of money. My, 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 uh, my daughter, one year, you know, I'm asking her to pick. She must have been uh, about seven or so, right? Uh, she got a write-up about this. So... She wound up picking the final four, came in eighth in the country. How did she do that? Well, because that was the year that Butler was there against Dukey, right? And so that was her magic, right? You know, so, so you know, that was also the same daughter, same daughter, she's a character, it's the same daughter who, who years back, she, she said, so, so you're a doctor? Yeah, yeah, a PhD, so what does that mean? And I said, well, I'm a book doctor. I thought that was a good way of explaining it. And then next thing you know, her teacher said, says to me, so I hear that you're a butt doctor. Well, sort of, you know, um, right? <laughs> that word butt, right? Um, think, about that. think about that word butt, right? Because a lot of times, whether we're talking about immigration, whether we're talking about uh, classes you're taking, whether we're talking about what you're writing, right? It's that word butt that really helps keep us moving in a direction that is unique, right? And that... Um, Really, in this case, that's what I'm trying to get at in the poem. I'm going to read Elvis in the Inner City, okay? Um, all right. I'm going to be videotaped. This is the first time. This, this, this one's being videotaped. All right. Uh, this, is, this is an Norton introduction to literature, so we'll see. I, uh, all right. Uh, I was Elvis in the 70s, not swinging hips, not wearing suede shoes, but just the same in canvas Chuck Taylors with my own felt moves, spinning rap, scratching vinyl to the tunes of Curtis Blow, the Sugar Hill Gang, Grandmaster Flash, and the hip-hop of the hibbity-hip-hip -hip of other rappers, making rap mine, rhyming to the boogie to the boom of the beat-beat-beat. 
Mom and dad's charros, same as Lawrence Walk's instrumentals, were stuff of old country boleros, but I had my rap, bebop, and I'd rap, rap, rap. The other side of the city, like the flip side of a one-hit wonder, bop heads to Van Morrison, Jim Morrison, and Van Halen. But I couldn't break a pop to lyrics that weren't about me, inner city, inequality, in the record store, I be. Boom boxes, sides of refrigerators, walked up and down projects, giving concerts for free, and rap was made for me. Until I, a lone white square on a checkerboard, reciting amidst blacks of the block, Froze, could not get my lips to vibrate, sink the refrain of the word nigger. I, rockless, rapless, without a side A nor a side B, stuttered, strutted, struggled to find someone who would rhyme with me. So this poem, right, I think is a true lesson in how we value ourselves. And I'll tell you why. I sent this poem out to a journal and um, never heard back, like after three years, I thought, wow, you is that bad? You didn't even give me a rejection, right? Right? I mean, come on, come on. I, you know, if I felt like, you know, an ugly guy like me, like I was back in middle school or something, and, and sure, and, 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 you know, not getting any, any, any attention. What's, I'm like, oh my, oh my goodness. And then one day I find out, you know, I get an email saying, okay, there's that special collection of rap, and, and, uh, Published in Callaloo, which was you know, a pretty really good journal, right? Nobel Nobel Prize winner. I also had had a uh, a poem in that collection. Um, the thing is, though, I had taken that poem away from this collection because I thought it's that bad, right? It is, this poem is that bad that th- n- someone won't even like reject it. And 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 then um, and then a few years later, you fast forward, and then um, the editor of the Norton Introduction to Literature wrote to me and said, we could use this poem. Would you give us permission? I said, all right, yeah, shit, why not? Um, think about that, right? So here's a poem that others thought was a sound poem that I was ready to just toss out because I was placing value not on what I thought of it, but what others thought of it, right? And I wasn't ready to take that leap. I wasn't, you know, and and I'm glad that that it did get accepted. And, I, you know, it, ironically, it's... it's being read by more individuals than, than anyone else. One other aside, uh, than any other poem, one other side about this, this is heartbreaking. Of all the heartbreaking stories that I'll tell you, none is more heartbreaking than the fact that some of the, the, the uh, singers and the groups that I mentioned, that like, like Jim Morrison, Van, uh, Morrison, Van Halen, that in the Norton, there are footnotes for people who don't know who they are. Now that to me, that to me is just tragic. I'm sorry, but you just, that should be common knowledge. And shame on you for not knowing your classics if that's the case, right? Um, the art of flipping. I'm 15 and flipping nickels from one hand to the other. It's like that when friends jump out of their desks and belly flop into the shallow ends of empty pools. Antonio sat in the back row, caught selling pot in the corner near Tilly Street, right before a book report was due. Troy used to sit near the window, caught jumping the Domino's driver, delivering near Truman, and Crazy Ken, who'd take up two desks, one for himself and the other for his legs. He wasn't seen again after he stole a Benz. So many empty desks for target shooters. Someone hollers as chalk crashes against the blackboard and dust trap no misses me. My legs can't stay locked. They want to chase the ghosts who left my classroom graveyard. They want to write on desks and mark the tombstones of the missing. I use hieroglyphics to mark their stories and gather ink sticks to build little men, but they too wind up hanged. All it takes is one missing letter and the sticks are damned. I shuffle back and forth as if I'm kicking the water that is being drained, but my body just floats. There's no tide or wave to wash me ashore, but as I look toward the board, I see Mr. DePeter's chalked hand. He's holding a crease book by someone named Henry David Thoreau. On the cover, a picture of a pond, and just as my body is bracing itself to follow the dimes of former classmates, Thoreau grabs the back of my shirt, drags me near his pond, and shows me the art of flipping book pages. That was, you know, back then we used to have like all 
uh, level classes. The, in other words, some classes that were uh, considered uh, basic level, right, and general level in college, it was really, th no, excuse me, not like, not like you, you have like AP, a, a, a P P P whatever, I mean, super advanced course, genius course. I mean, I, there's no way that I could ever, ever take the kinds of schedules, you know, the kind of courses that, that you took. I tell you, I don't know, I don't know how you do it. Um, and so in, in this class in particular, I, you know, talk about beating myself up. My freshman year, I was in a college level class and I didn't feel like I belonged. I did not feel like I belonged. You know, I had one incident with one teacher who at one point gave a, a, a paper back and took points off for not having a comma. And this is a true story. So, so, so uh, I was like, wow, you just took points off and there's a comma here. And I showed it to a friend and he was like, no, that's, that's a comma, you know? And, and then she was like, what, what's going on? I go, there's a, you took points off, I have a comma here. And she goes, no, no, no. And, and we're kind of going back and forth. And she goes, I'll, yeah, okay, well, I'll see you after school. And I said to her, yeah, you'll see me walking home after school. So, so anyway, it, so it wasn't a good experience. She um, could have had a, a, a worse ending because then she sent me to the principal's office. And in the note, I didn't read it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get, you know, I'm just get, uh, you know, a couple of detentions, whatever. And, and, and I read the note and it said he threatened to beat me up after school. Right, and I was like, "Oh boy, this is more than commas now." Right, so I didn't have this. Is, so I didn't have a great experience, and I thought, you know, I, I don't know if I if I fit with the, these folks. I, I don't, you know, I don't. And and so I wound up taking a lower level course. Okay, the following year, and I had a teacher who was incredible and who showed me that you know what, you you measure your self worth in a different way, not by these kinds of experiences. And it really, really helped me. It was also around the time that I wrote, um, that, that I experienced um, leaving my backpack in a classroom, right? And uh, so I went back uh, to get it. And when I went back, there was a book there, uh, a, a Shakespeare anthology, which I loved me some Shakespeare. I was a nerd, right? And, um, and so I thought, wow, what do I do with this thing? Like, I, I, I want it. I want this book. And we didn't have books at home. We, we didn't. Um, and so looked to my left, looked to my right, right? Winking while rubbing his Elizabethan beard like an Aladdin lamp ready to grant him a sonnet. Shakespeare dared me to steal him. This diamond-shaped <laughs> face, this jewel, this staple Bible of English. He smiled, piled high on grapes of wrath, burning on... Fahrenheit 451, dared me to steal them. The principal's rule book screamed at me that afternoon, warning me to principal myself. But the shouts of, shouts of Caliban trapped inside that 10th grade classroom boomed, made me forget a bandit's doom, reminded me that at 16, the only student whose notebook spoke poor, working, blue-collar Spanish, t'was I. I needed to steal their books. And I did. <laughs> and every once in a while, someone says, you still have that book? I said, yeah. And then someone else, and then someone said, you're going to return that book? I said, no, I, 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 I have it. I, I have it. But you think about that, how, how in many ways, for me, that became a sort of metaphor, right? Because what it taught me is that all these times, as I'm measuring my value by what others say, that I needed to control my life, that I needed to set my own destiny. And so, ironically enough, it, I happened to go then into a field that is not often populated by Latino speakers, and that is English, right? So I, I'm a professor of English, like, like you heard. And um, so, uh, how are we doing with time? We okay? But this book uh, just came out um, two, uh, two weeks ago, actually. Uh, it's, it's my second collection, when, when Love Was Reels, right? And um, in this book, what I, what I do is I look at Latin American film, and I also look at uh, Latino actors and famous scenes. So, um, in this case, in this poem, I'm looking at this film called Walk Proud, okay, starring none other than Robbie Benson, who was a heartthrob, right? Even I thought the guy was cute, I tell you. I mean, he was that good looking. And, and so here, Robbie Benson, who was also the voice of the Beast and Beauty and the Beast, he's, apparently he's out of career in animation and whatnot. And, but yeah, talk about third lines. But he, but he also 
played at one point a Latino, right? And uh, which isn't that unusual, right? The, the uh, uh, white actors portraying Latinos, right? So uh, for example, um, you have um, Mr. You talking to me? You talking to me? Right? I know you're not talking to me. Robert De Niro, right? Who played a Latino at one time. You had uh, there's a whole list, right, of people who you think really played. So, so here's Robbie Benson, who uh, before this had played a a wholesome basketball player from Kansas in a movie called One on One, which I thought was a pretty good movie too, right? So, so he goes from that to playing this role. All right, this one's called Scene from Walk Proud, and it's from my collection, When Love Woods. Can you, can you do something with it? Focus on it? All right, never mind. It's okay. You know how they do that? It's like, no. All right, uh, see, scene from Walk Proud. Robbie Benson, we remember his one-on-one -on -one dribbles, baller from a small town where corn stalks replaced corner street signs. This time, he's Emilio Mendez with dark contact lenses, their hardness poking his blue-eyed jeans, his brown makeup spray painted on his face like the sign of a crip. To leave his gang of Aztecs, he has to get jumped out, walk down lines of street soldiers, punches, fists, departing gifts for this Latin king. But for Rolando, Jimmy, and me, lying back on a sofa on a lazy Sunday afternoon when even the police don't bother to take calls or circle around the block, Benson's jump shots release swarms of dreams and jokes. Rolando says, that's so perverse, let's play it in reverse. And when we rewind the tape, the punches become Emilio's punishment for the claims to be what he's not. He returns his low rider, tosses out his bandana, spits into beer cans, and goes back to Kansas. We continue by playing our own lives backwards. Bus drivers give back nickels. Subways rise off tracks. Jimmy's father walks out of prison. His mother walks out of her boyfriend's bedroom, and my neighbor, the old man on the sixth floor, poses for a picture with family at his side, his front door open wide, a baby in his arms, his mouth swallowing his first slur. All right, all right that's enough. That's enough, <laughs> that's enough shameless plug for that, for that book. Um, I, I do want to say that this, so when I wrote, here's what happened. So I wrote this book, which, which was painful, right? So Eugene O'Neill says he wrote Long Day's Journey Into Night about his mother, right, being hooked on drugs and, you know, just a painful story, right? And um, I felt like this was, he said it's written with this, you know, blood and sweat, right? And I thought, wow, this is, there were times when I was like, I can't do this to myself. I can't write these poems. I, you know, I'm emotionally just just too much and even reading them sometimes I go usually I go home too really really exhausted right um, and then I thought I'm not gonna do this again to myself so this time I'm gonna tell a different story and and um, and I did I tried to distance and try to and, and so that's why I use film right just so that I wouldn't have and then one day I'm driving home from work I'm about 50 pages into it and I start crying like a baby over, over this this individual I'm writing about and, um, and I shared that with a couple of writers, and they said, that's what you should do, right? That's what I just told you you should be doing. So, you know, it, it, to me, again, you know, talk about, you know, what we do when we write, right? Do we really write with our hearts? And I felt good about writing with my heart, even though I was trying to avoid doing so. All right, so I'm going to end it with this poem. It's a slightly longer poem. Autobiography of a New England Latino, right? I will tell you this, that when you hear it, when you hear these things, you know, it's a Thursday night, so, so don't look at these and say, you know, as you hear these lines, don't say, oh, that's sad, oh, that's tragic. Look, some of it is sad, some of it is tragic, but the fact is that sometimes, you know, the best way to deal and cope with some of these things is by laughing about them. Because if, if we didn't laugh about them, the fact is that we drive ourselves crazy. I know, I, I would have driven myself crazy. So, get some water first. Um. <laughs> <laughs>
I can't even, I don't even know what this is. This thing's so old. I don't even, can't even, who knows? Our sponsor today, sponsor, <laughs> sponsor, sponsored by the Creative Writing Club. Thank you for the beautiful. All right. Autobiography of a New England Latino. And I do, again, I do read it fast because life goes by really fast, really quickly. And there are times when, when, when we experience certain moments and we don't realize, we think afterwards, wow, what, what just happened? Okay. Um, so. In 1967, San Salvador El Salvador fathered my brown, and so I was born in the capital that salutes the Pacific, the mother of so many brown rivers, lakes, ponds that held hands with the volcanic rocks that tumbled brown, burned the soil brown, and browned the country in civil brown turmoil in the 1970s when my family left to New England where factories, my mother's sewing machine, and my father's spray paint machine were brown, and I first attended John Winthrop Elementary School, a school full of browns, a sec separate but equal type of brown that was not El Salvador brown, but are desperate to move out of the projects brown. And so my parents poured their wages into a tuition for a private middle school classroom where I was the only brown and I was taught to make my language a less subtle brown so that by the time I attended New London High School, which had shades of Puerto Rican brown and tints of Latin American brown, I had shed so much brown that I was accused of not being enough brown. But I figured I knew the roots of my brown and felt comfortable, comfortable enough with my brown, even if I was losing some of my Spanish brown. And I continued to lose it too, not because I wanted to, but because most of the brown at the college I attended was Republican Brown, which spoke a different dialect of Brown, and by the end of my four years, my Spanish Brown had faded so much that I became an Anglicized Spanish Brown, and I was awarded the College's Excellence in English Award, which I was pretty sure had never been given to a graduating Brown, and when they said this year's recipient is Jose Gonzalez Brown, I could have sworn I saw hundreds of people scrape their ears in an attempt to fix whatever was making them hear Brown, and after graduating, I figured I'd get a job teaching English, even if I was Brown, but on an interview for an English teacher, position at a small boarding school, headmaster told me that if I was serious about getting a job, I'd teach Spanish Brown because there's such a, such a shortage of Spanish Browns. To which I said, thank you, headmaster, but I just assume not teach Spanish Brown. And when his eyes said, thank you, Mr. Brown, but unless you're willing to teach Spanish Brown, I won't have a job for you, Mr. Brown. I changed my mind and I did what I had to, even if my first language was no longer Spanish Brown. And I taught there until one brown day in the middle of the school year. I just had to ask him, I know you hired me for something else, but someday can I teach English here, even if I am brown? And his office, office door replied, if you didn't want to teach Spanish brown, maybe you shouldn't have been brown, which told me it was time for me to leave that master, get my master's, and that I decided to attend what else? Brown. Yeah, exactly. I'm telling you. It, it, life writes itself. So Brown University, which was Ivy League brown. And... and, and and, and you want to talk about a different shade of brown? That was like a culture shock brown. Mommy, help me. This is a bad novella. i never seen this before kind of brown. And there were so many educated liberal browns. I thought that there had been some kind of going out of business clearance sale on diplomas for browns. Not that the majority was brown, but I just wasn't too used to associating the college experience with browns. So even a little bit of brown was enough to make me think that colleges were turning somewhat brown. And while at Brown, I student taught at Providence's Holt High School, which had many Browns. So I wanted very badly for my students to recognize my Brown and say, if he's at Brown and he's Brown, there's hope for us young Browns. But they just thought I was Brown University Brown, not inner city Brown. And students couldn't see themselves in my Brown. And so unaccustomed were they to seeing any shade of Brown in front of their class that they thought it was impossible that I could be raised Brown. But I didn't let that get me too much down. And when I graduated from Brown, I became a Brown Brown, a Brown squared, a Brown times Brown which for some people, teachers, even only meant that I was Ivy Brown because I am Brown, which made me want to point to Brown graduates who were Brown because their parents or grandparents were Brown, making them legacy Browns. Brown's cubed. And I continued my schooling at the University of Rhode Island and worked toward my PhD because of, not in spite of being brown. And I studied literature that was brown because growing up I had been assigned stories like Young Goodman Brown, but I had never been assigned a book by a brown author, which never made sense to me because I just knew that in all the years that browns had been in the U.S., even in the part that was brown before the U.S. became the U.S., browns had to have something to say, even if it wasn't about being brown. And while I worked on my brown dissertation, I taught English at Three Rivers Community College which had quite a few Browns, so many of whom juggled coursework with family and jobs and being Brown, that it was tough for them to one day say, I have a college degree even though I'm Brown, which made me appreciate being educated and being Brown, and I became ABD, a Brown doctor, and probably became URI's first English PhD Brown, which isn't that big a deal, because in higher education, if you're Brown, you can lay claim to being the first this and that as a Brown, and that's why when I tell people that I'm a professor of English, every once in a while someone says something like, 
Dr. Brown, you must teach a different type of English that has to have some kind of brown. Maybe you teach second language brown English or remedial brown English or developmental English for the brown because after all, you're brown. But it matters none to me, master of my own brown destiny, because even on the coldest, snowiest day in Connecticut, even when it seems I've been brown beaten, I can still feel the power of my own brown, brown like a brown beat the board of bed, brown like a brown trunk of a brown tree that's been whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked and whacked until it's become nothing but a strong brown wooden frame that holds a brown diploma high up in the air, telling the world, I'm educated and I'm brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.